Hey everybody, it's Michelle, and welcome to my channel. Uh, yeah, you've seen the title of the video, so I guess there's no easy way to segue into this subject. Uh, so you saw the intro, and I did put a, uh, a, uh, viewer discretion is advised, uh, because we will be discussing, uh, several different things that are prevalent to this case. So, uh, if you are, do not want to hear about the specifics of this horrific case against a beautiful eight-year-old boy, um, then I suggest you click out now. But, uh, so, but if you want to continue to watch this video, this is just, uh, you know, I've seen the docuseries. It's, uh, this is a rebuttal or my opinion, uh, concerning this case. And yes, I have watched the highly acclaimed uh, docu-series that is currently on Netflix called The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. And uh, when I watched this, uh, I started watching it in the afternoon. Uh, but prior to that, I think maybe the day before or the morning of, uh, I on my iPad, I get notifications from Netflix and it said uh, The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. Uh, you know, it was recommended to me. So I decided to give it a go and start watching it in the afternoon by myself. And I, I started watching it knowing just from the description on the video on Netflix, uh, I knew what I was getting into. So, uh, I, I personally, uh, can, um, you know, uh, separate myself as far as cases go. Uh, but when it comes to the abuse and the torture and the premeditated killing of an innocent little boy, I've got something to say about that. And it really tugs at my heartstrings because I am a mother. And yes, my children may are grown up. They are in their 20s. Uh, my son is almost 30, uh, but regardless, even though my kids are grown, I can go back in my head and look at them at eight years old. And as a mother, you are, when you have a child, you are sworn to protect that child forever. And in this case, in the trials of Gabriel Fernandez, this mother. She shouldn't even be called a mother. Uh, I believe that is a term of endearment. Uh, I believe it is a title given to uh, the person who gave birth to you as a term of love, as a term of respect, as a term of uh, protection, that you are going to protect me. You are going to love me. You are going to make sure that I am clothed, that I am fed, that I am, that I am, you know, you're going to be with me for the rest of my life. And, uh, in this case, you know, this is not the case with this docuseries. And, uh, if you do not have Netflix, uh, uh, you can continue to watch this video. But for those of you who do have Netflix and want to watch this docuseries, I highly recommend it. Uh, I recommend watching it with a box of tissues. Uh, you will be go through several emotions. And I watched this last week. And I've been thinking about it every single day since last week when I watched it. And it just, you know, it angers me. It saddens me. It pretty much every emotion that you can think of I have went through. And I don't know the family and I don't know this l little boy. But as a mother, uh, I, I feel that this boy was let down not only by his, his family unit, I believe the entire system let him down. And I do agree with the docuseries on that part. So uh, for those of you who don't have Netflix, uh, I will be going through uh, this docuseries, just little blurbs, not the entire docuseries or else it will be an hour and a half long video. But I highly recommend if you do have Netflix, 
I recommend you watching this series. Uh, if the uh, topic of the series does not bother you. Um, but what the series is about, it is, it is about Gabriel Fernandez. Uh, he was eight years old when he was brutally murdered by his mother, Pearl Fernandez, and her boyfriend, Isadio Aguirre. Or Aguirre, I'm sorry. And as, de and as detailed as it was in the documentary, uh, the entire system let this little boy down. And uh, a journalist from the LA Times actually wrote about this case. And then uh, the producers and the directors uh, heard of this journalist. And the journalist chimes in in this docuseries uh, every now and again uh, about this case. So, uh, you know, it's all the way from the top to the LA County Sheriff's Department to all the way at the bottom to DCFS and everything in between. It is very, very sad. Uh, in 2013, when this happened, I may have read something because this was, a this case was blown wide open worldwide. And through my research, I have found numerous articles worldwide on little Gabriel Fernandez. And uh, I, I may have read something when this happened and then put it out of my head. I may have told myself, oh my gosh, poor little boy. And I moved on and then forgotten about it. And then when the docuseries came out, it was brought to my attention again. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's been bothering me for a week. So this is just my own opinion. I do not have an a degree in psychology. I'm not a police officer. This is just my own op own opinion as uh, you know, Joe Citizen uh, on this case and uh, my opinions on the docu series. So let's get into it. So uh, let's start off with. Uh, you know, little Gabriel was born to Pearl, uh, who, when she found out she was pregnant, she did not want him from the beginning. She had already had, uh, kids, uh, when she was pregnant with Gabriel and she didn't want to have him, but the family talked her into having him and giving him up, uh, to another set of family members, to his uncles. And, uh, this doesn't matter in any way, but they say it in the docuseries. His uncle was gay and had a partner, and they raised Gabriel uh, from the time he was a newborn. And they gave him love. They gave him, you know, they they fed him. They clothed him. They told them they they told him he loved. They loved him. They 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 were parents. That's what parents do. And then, unfortunately, uh, I don't think they really had legal custody of Gabriel. Uh, so, after a few years, Gabriel went to live with his grandparents. And he was also loved by his grandparents. I know there has been some speculation that the grandparents only wanted him for the, the money from the state. I can't confirm or deny that, uh, but there has been some speculation, some talk, some gossip, uh, that the grandparents only wanted him for the money from the state in order to take, take care of him. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they said it in the docuseries, so I thought I would mention it. Uh, you know, uh, this just wasn't a crime of passion, uh, and we'll get to Isadio's, uh, when he was interviewed by detectives after calling the police and saying, uh, you know, and, and being arrested. We'll get to that in a second. But, uh, you know, I just feel that, you know, all Gabriel wanted was to be loved. And he was passed around. His mother didn't want him. His biological father, I believe, uh, I don't think at the time of his birth he was in jail, but he ended up go being in jail at the time of Gabriel's murder. And he really does have some remorse about not being there when Gabriel was murdered. Had he known this was 
was going on, he would have done something about it. And they do interview him briefly in the docuseries. Uh, and, uh, so he, he did show remorse that his son died a horrible death. And they, and they do mention that also in the docuseries. Uh, the police, like I said, this wasn't a one-time crime of passion thing. This little boy had been abused for months, if not at least a year. Uh, he had told his teacher, mentioned to his teacher after class one day, uh, he asked his teacher a question and he said, is it normal for your parents to hit you with a belt? And she said something to the effect of, well, there are some parents that do give a spanking to their kids and they do use a belt. And he said, well, is it normal to get hit with the metal of the belt and bleed? And right then the red flag started going off. So she immediately called the hotline for social services. And uh, teachers do have this power to call the hotline and and say that they believe child abuse is going on in this family. Give the name, the name of the child, and, and uh, they go out and investigate. Well... It wasn't just a one-time thing. Social services went out there numerous times to investigate. Uh, and the mother, uh, I hate even calling her that. She doesn't deserve that title. Uh, we'll call her Pearl because that's her name. Uh, Pearl knew how to work the system. She's been in the system since she was 11 years old. Uh, she ran away from home when she was 11. Uh, she claims to have been gang raped when she was 11. Uh, she claims to have a number of... of mental illnesses and uh whether or not that's true or not i'm not a psychologist i'm not a psychiatrist i'm just giving you my opinion opinion of what i have researched and what the docuseries has said uh and you know see uh emergency social services or child protective services i'm not sure what the agency is called in la county this happened in palmdale california uh, in 2012 is when the abuse started and it may have even started before then. Uh, but he, when social services went out there a number of times, they didn't ask to see Gabriel. They took the mother's word for it. Uh, they even, when the sheriff was called out, the sheriff said that he would put him in the cop car and scare him straight for lying because Pearl mentioned the fact that he does this all the time. He lies. He say he's being abused and he's not being abused. She knew how to work the system. She had been in jail before. She had a record. Uh, she knew how to work the system and they basically just took her word for it without doing a body chart on this little boy. Uh, if that was me, if I was the social services emergency worker that was called out, that was that would be the first thing I would ask. Before I would even talk to the mother, I would say, I want to see the child. Uh, by law in L.A. County, they have to do a body chart. That is one of the number one things uh, they have to do. And this one particular woman who was sent out several times never did a body chart to see if the allegations were true. Okay, so, uh, and we'll get to, there's more to deal with the social workers as well later on. Uh, L.A. County Sheriff's Department was called out numerous times uh, to this address where Gabriel lived. Um, and uh, they never asked to see the child. And uh, they never asked where he was. Whether they gave an excuse that he wasn't home or not, I'm not quite sure. But in reality, Gabriel was kept in a box it was a built-in type of dresser they took the shelves out uh and he was kept in this box the handles were handcuffed closed he wasn't allowed he was he wasn't allowed to eat food at times they kept him you know uh from from eating uh, he wasn't allowed bathroom breaks. He, if he had to go to the bathroom, he had to do it in there, which is degrading and humiliating in and of itself. 
Uh, he had one chore uh, that they mentioned in the docuseries, and that was to clean out the cat litter box. And if he didn't do it right, uh, Isario and Pearl, Pearl, his mother, Isario, her boyfriend, made him eat cat feces and cat litter if he didn't do it right or if he was bad. Uh, that's what he would eat. And uh, when he died and the medical examiner did a postmortem, they did find the cat litter in his stomach contents, which is just freaking disgusting. Uh, I, I can't believe the torture and the humiliation and, the, and the, uh, the cruelty they did to this little boy. Um, but these two thought they were smarter than the law. And in my research, in because I am researching multiple cases at once, uh, the criminal always thinks he's going to outsmart the law and they're not going to get caught or they're going to get out of it. So uh, two days before Gabriel died, when the event happened, uh, Pearl called 911 and said that her son had fallen in the bathtub or the shower and uh, was unconscious. Now, you guys, if I was a criminal, I'll just leave it at that, I could think up 20,000 other excuses to say why this child has these injuries other than slipping in the freaking bathtub and becoming unconscious. So while they're on the phone with 911 and emergency services is on the way, they and they, they go through this in the docuseries. Uh, they, the 911 operator says, are you doing CPR? Well, they said yes, that her boyfriend was attempting CPR on the boy. Which, when someone becomes unconscious and is not breathing, when you are told to do CPR, especially on somebody you love, you are supposed to do it until emergency services gets, gets there. And when the, uh, when the uh, EMT testified or the paramedic and the fireman testified at the court hearing, they asked, that was the first question they asked. They said, did you see either Isadio or Pearl doing CPR on Gabriel? And they both said no. And you are supposed to keep doing it until the paramedics get there. Uh, and they had not seen any any evidence to suggest that they even tried to do CPR on this little boy. They then were performing the, the, the EMTs and the paramedics were, were trying to perform CPR on this little boy. And while they're performing CPR and intubating him, they started noticing his injuries and they started, they didn't say it out loud, but they were saying to themselves, this little boy did not slip and fall in the bathroom. This is something else. And yes, it ended up being something else. So they ended up rushing uh, Gabriel to the hospital. And if this were my child, I'd be fighting to get in that ambulance. And neither of them wanted to go with Gabriel in the ambulance to the hospital. Uh, their excuse was, is that the police wanted to interview me. Well, what I would have told the police is, you know what? I'll be at the hospital with my kid. You want to talk to me? You talk to me when my child is out of danger, or you can talk to me there, but I'm going, you know, at this point they weren't considered suspects, but they, they, they didn't want to go to the hospital with their own child, you know, with Pearl didn't want to go with their own child, which is suspect in and of itself. And I just feel like from minute one, to me, they would have been suspect. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, when little Gabriel got to the hospital, the uh, of course, the whole team knew he was coming in. Uh, they call it a certain code. And I know a nurse... Uh, test, you know, she gave her story, uh, as to what the code is called. I can't remember, remember ex exactly at this time, but they gave the code of this little boy was coming in and he was not responsive. And, uh, so they brought him in, they started working on him and 
the nurse was actually writing down what the doctors and other uh, medical staff was yelling out to her, and she was cataloging it. And cataloging his injuries, uh, broken ribs, uh, cigarette burns. Uh, there were BB gun pellets to his face. Uh, numerous, numerous, numerous injuries. I mean, too numerous to even mention in this video. And if you want to go look it up, you, uh, the medical report is online. Uh, I did manage to find it. I'm not going to show any, uh, post-mortem photos of Gabriel in this video. Any photos you have seen at the start of this video are of Gabriel alive. And ultimately, uh, that is the, uh, my, I want people to remember Gabriel alive. I don't, there's enough of those photos out there online. And if you want to go look them up, you can go and look them up. But in this video, you will not see any post-mortem photos. Uh, uh, if you want to watch the docuseries, they do show a couple of them. I'm not sure if he's in the coma when they, sh when they took the photos or if he had already passed when they took those photos. So, uh, yeah, the uh, Pearl's uh, story and uh, Isario's story did not start adding up. So they were uh, immediately arrested, taken down to the station, and interviewed separately. While Isario admitted right away that he, in his words, he saw red, he flipped out, and he uh, lost his temper and uh, started beating little Gabriel to death. Pearl claims uh, that she was there. Uh, she was afraid for her own life and she did nothing to stop it. But yet, through the detective's investigation, they found out that Pearl and Isadio were texting each other uh, a couple of months prior to Gabriel's death. She was researching how to get away with murder. Yeah, can you believe it? Yeah, she did. Uh, and they were talking by text, and she said it as a matter of fact, like, I'm cooking dinner, yep, I'm researching how to get away with murder. You know, she just kind of threw it in this jumble of text she was sending Isadio, and, he's, and he said something like, oh, okay, or cool, or whatever. You know, it didn't phase him at all. Uh, it didn't phase her at all. And at no point... Prior to Gabriel losing his life, did they take a step back and say, what we're premeditating is wrong? It, it, it did not occur to them that what they were doing to this poor, poor baby was wrong. They thought this is what he deserved. And, you know, they had psychologists and psychiatrists. They interviewed them on this docuseries. And one of them mentioned that that Pearl saw Gabriel as, for lack of a better word, maybe a threat because he was well-liked at school. He was very smart. He had just won a reading award uh, a few months before his death. He was very excited about that. Did his mother attend that assembly? No, but that didn't matter. He was very, very excited. He had many friends at school. Uh, despite what was going on at home, and yes, he was missing a lot of school because his mother would not send him to school with bruises and, and marks all over his face, uh, and all over his body. Um, she would keep him from school until those injuries were in the healing stages, and then she'd send him back to school, and they'd ask Gabriel what happened, and one of the excuses was, is that he fell off his bike. Uh... I, I just can't believe that, uh, they would do this to this little boy. It's unfathomable. It really, really is. Uh, you know, and, uh, so when they, back to when they interviewed Asadio, he admitted everything he said, uh, he, he claims that this was not premeditated, that he saw red, uh, claiming that maybe it was a crime of passion, you know, that he just flipped out and started beating this little boy. He did not plan it. He did not, uh, this was not first degree murder. He did not plan it. He just saw Red, freaked out, uh, lost control of his emotions. And before he knew it, Gabriel was dead. 
Pearl says she was in the room and she was there and she was present. She admitted that, but she claims she had nothing to do with the death of her son. She claims that she was also abused and battered by Isario. So uh, I think that's a bunch of horseshit, frankly, to put it bluntly. Uh, I do not believe her. Uh, do I believe she was the mastermind? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. So, uh, they were, uh, charged with first degree murder, uh, and it ended up on the DA's, you know, desk and the DA, I'll show a picture of him right here and his name. I can't think of his name right now. Uh, but, uh, it landed on his desk and, uh, you know, there were, there were several other instances. In fact, uh, there, the public was calling out that this was a hate crime because Gabriel was forced to actually wear dresses, uh, and they called him gay. Uh, whether this was because he lived with his two uncles who were gay, which there is nothing wrong with that, or whether it was because he was uh, more of the quiet type and maybe not so, uh, you know, maybe he was effeminate. I don't know. I didn't know Gabriel. I, I don't know. Uh, but the public cried out that they wanted hate charges. A hate crime uh, also added to the charges against these two. Well, the DA decided, yes, this could be considered a hate crime, but this is the least of our worries and we have a better shot of trying them for murder because it carries a, a, a heftier penalty than a hate crime. A hate, a hate crime in California only carries a maximum of three years. Um, so I can understand why they would not charge them in addition to the hate crime and the special circumstances of torture. Uh, I understand that, but there were a lot of people up in arms in California that they thought they should have also been charged with a hate crime as well. So, uh, they initially were going to try them together, uh, but, uh, in the docuseries, uh, Pearl pretty much acts out in court. She was not, uh, mild a mild mannered individual and would sit there and just listen. She was acting out in court. Plus her attorneys claimed that she needed psychological testing, uh, that, uh, they wanted to make sure she was, she knew the judicial process and that she needed psychological testing. And they ultimately decided that she, uh, she was interviewed by multiple psychologists and psychiatrists and they determined that she does, she may have, uh, uh, a personality disorder. She has anxiety. She has depression. She has a low IQ and a number of other mental things that are wrong with her. Uh, and that may be so. Uh, like I said, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. This is my own opinion. Uh, and that may be so. Uh, so they decided to try them separately. So they, they tried Isario first and then they were going to try her next. So again, this was a capital murder case and they brought witnesses galore and they were swimming in evidence galore. Uh, this little boy was beaten with two different bats. He was shot in the face with a BB gun he had prior injuries that were in the stages of healing. He had the current injuries that actually killed him. He was basically bludgeoned to death. Uh, he was made to sleep in a cabinet with a sock in his mouth and a bandana over his eyes in a locked cabinet that was locked with handcuffs. Now, what if there was a fire in that apartment? You know, uh... I just, I just don't get it. I, I just don't get it how, how a, a mother could do that to her son. I just do not get it. I cannot fathom it. I cannot compute it in my brain that somebody who's supposed to love you and protect you would do this kind of shit to you. And I'm sorry for swearing guys, but it, it really just does torque me off because this, this was a beautiful little boy. And, uh, so... 
you know, uh, they eventually brought the crime scene investigators into the apartment and the crime scene investigator was marking all the blood spatter around the apartment. And she said she usually marks it with red stickers, red arrows. There was so much blood spatter around the apartment, she ran out of red stickers and had to start using yellow stickers. And they showed pictures in the docuseries of all of these stickers all over the house. And, uh, which is sad. Uh, and there was also, uh, blood in the sink, uh, which told the investigators that the individuals responsible for this crime tried to clean up. Uh, like I said, they fed him cat litter. They put a bandana and a sock in his mouth, knocked his teeth out, hit him with a bat, shot him in the face with a BB gun, and they pepper sprayed him for fun while they laid him in the bathtub. He would show up at school with bruises all over his face as well as fresh cigarette burns and a shaved head. Now, yes, they did show a photo of him that was taken. Uh, it was actually for Mother's Day, and they took three photos with big letters that said M-O-M. -M. And he had bruises, healing bruises and marks all over his face and his neck. And he had a shaved head that had patches missing. And his teacher could see scars or wounds that were in the healing stages on his head. So this is the second time. So she does call the hotline again and reports child abuse. So they go and visit uh, his home again, and they do not ask to see the boy. It is the same emergency social worker that goes out there. She does not ask to see Gabriel. And she just takes the mother's word for it that it was a bike accident. He fell off his bike. And uh, like I said before, Pearl knew how to work the system. She had been in the system since she was 11 years old. And... Uh, she may not have been book smart, but, and I don't want to say street smart either. She was just not smart at all, but she knew how to work it. She knew how to control it and she knew how to make it the outcome that she wanted. So, uh, and also Gabriel's brother, uh, testified in court. Uh, there were no cameras allowed in court when the minors, his brother and sister testified. There were no cameras allowed in court. Um, but his older brother did testify that Aguirre would, and Aguirre was 6'2 and like 280. He was a big dude. And he would grab Gabriel by the neck and pick him up and hold him up against the wall. Uh, while Aguirre would knock uh, the air out of him on several occasions. So while he was holding it up by the neck, I guess he was punching him. <clears throat> also, the medical examiner testified that it took him several days to do Gabriel's autopsy. And the DA asked the medical examiner, does it normally take you that long to do an autopsy? And he said, no. And he asked, well, why did it take you that long? He said, because I had to catalog all of his injuries. That's how many injuries he had, uh, which is so sad. So the uh, trial took a break and then the same jury came back and had to decide Isadio's fate, whether he would uh, get uh, a life sentence without possibility of parole or if they could all, it had to be a unanimous decision for uh, a death sentence. But how does somebody one moment portray themselves as this person and then the next moment goes home and can beat on an, a defenseless eight-year-old boy? I just don't get it. How they can turn it on and off. I don't get it. And uh, uh, I just think uh, he wanted his workmates to see the person he wanted them to see. And I think he truly was a, a monster in the making, whether or not Pearl, you know, encouraged him to do this. Uh, he could have said no. He could have called the police. He could have told her F off. He could have done a number of different things, but he didn't. He went along with it. He was a willing participant. And frankly, 
Yes, he did get the death penalty. I am happy he got the death penalty. Some of you may not agree with that. Some of you may oppose the death penalty. I do have a family member that lives in this house who adamantly opposes the death penalty. And after we watched this series, this docuseries, we had an hour-long heated conversation about the death penalty. And I don't know if you know, I do live in Colorado. And just recently, as of February 26th, uh, the uh, legis le legislation was passed and they are repealing the death penalty here in Colorado. Uh, it is on the governor's desk right now. Uh, he does not have to sign it in order for it to go into effect. Uh, but he can kiss the deal, so to speak, and sign it uh, if he wants to. But he doesn't have to sign it if he doesn't want to. And it can still go into law. Uh those men who are sitting currently on death row, they have been convicted. Uh, so their death penalty convictions will stand. Uh, but anybody who is convicted of first degree murder will only carry the maximum sentence in Colorado after July 1st of uh, life in prison without the possibility of parole. So, uh, yeah, uh, Colorado had the death penalty and then repealed the death penalty in 1974. And then in 1979, it was, uh, again, passed by legislation and put on the governor's desk. Uh, the governor at the time was Dick Lamb. He did not sign, uh, sign it into law. He let it go through and become law without his signature. So uh, we've had it. Recently, since 1979, and as, as of July 1st, 2020, anybody who's convicted will receive the maximum penalty of life in prison. Imprisonment without possibility per, of parole if they are convicted of first-degree murder. Jim. And, oh, Pearl, let's not forget about her. Well, her lawyers told her that, uh, you know, uh, Isadio was convicted and was given the death penalty. So, uh they did a plea deal with her and in order to save her life, they gave her life without the possibility of parole, which if that was me, if I was the DA, I would have said, no, let's go to trial because I think we got a pretty good shot of getting her the death penalty. And did, does she, did she deserve the death penalty? You judge for yourself. My personal belief is yep. And I think she was the mastermind. I think she was uh, she planned it. She was trying to get away with murder. And uh, she uh, was just as guilty as Asadio, if not if not more. And uh, so uh, they show her in court when she is entering her plea deal. And she's very timid and shy and very quiet. And that was an act. And don't be fooled by that because you will see in a few episodes prior to that a, a, a body cam video of a guard in the prison after she had been arrested. Uh, they tossed her cell. And uh, she's in there for murder. They toss her cell. They could toss your cell whenever they want uh, or if they have cause to. And... Uh, they tossed her cell and they threw her makeup all over the place. And she was more pissed about her makeup being broken and all over the place than she was about why she's there. You know, again, it's going back to her what's, it's all about her. She doesn't give two shits of why she's there. She's worried about her freaking makeup. So, uh, you know, it's, it's unfathomable to me that a mother, and I hate calling her that, but it's unfathomable unfathomable to me that a mother could do that to her to her own child
right, everybody, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I know it was, it, there's a couple hot button topics in there, so please sound off in the comments below. Please be kind to others down there. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts uh, on this subject. Have you watched uh, the docu-series? Have you not? Do you want to watch it? How do you feel about it? Let me know down there below. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you sticking around, and I'll see you in the next one. And remember, they were loved by many, but mourned by all. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.